Welcome to Medical Matters Weekly with Dr. Trey Dobson, presented by Southwestern Vermont Healthcare and Catamount Access Television. Welcome everyone. Today is August 24th, 2022. I'm Trey Dobson, Chief Medical Officer at Southwestern Vermont Medical Center and an emergency medicine physician with Dartmouth Health. And this is Medical Matters Weekly, a show about the healthcare uh, things that matter to you most. I, I messed up there. A show about the aspects of healthcare that matter to you most. I, I have to apologize. I just got done with a long drive across the country. Uh, so I'm trying to get my body adjusted to standing up again. Uh, my guest today is Dr. Kathleen Martin Guinness. Did I pronounce your last name correct, Kathleen? Yeah, that's right. So thank you so much for joining us. Kathleen is a health and science behavioral science, sorry, health and exercise behavioral scientist with more than 20 years of experience researching, teaching, and presenting on topics related to behavior change, motivation, and the psychological benefits of exercise. So Kathleen, we are so excited to have you on the show. Well, I'm excited to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation, Trey. Just a few bullet points, and you can read more about Kathleen's bio on the website. Uh, professor and distinguished scholar, and I'm not going to pronounce this right, uh, and Reichwald Family Chair in Preventative Medicine at the University of British Columbia? That's right. Okay, great. Uh, principal investigator of the Canadian Disability Participation Project, and then importantly, uh, gets a lot of money, actually, uh, not for her own use, but for her research use and that of her staff. Uh, through through uh, grants and other types of initiatives. She actually recently received $11 million in research funding as the principal investigator, the PI, uh, and $20 million in total research funding. That's pretty amazing. Uh, that must be a, a passion because I know that's a full-time job itself. Yeah, it sure is. Writing grants, as, uh, it, it keeps scientists very busy. So tell us, where, where are you right this moment? Uh, so I'm in beautiful Kelowna, which is in the interior of British Columbia, about uh, a five-hour drive east of Vancouver in Canada. Oh, wow, that's great. Have you been to Vermont before? I have, uh, and I would say that uh, Kelowna, where I, I should mention I'm also a professor at University of British Columbia on the Okanagan campus, and I have visited Vermont, and I would say it's, it's almost as beautiful as Kelowna. <laughs> That's a great way to say it. Well, we'd love to have you back down sometime and we can talk about that uh, after the show. So let's just get into the subject here. What drew you to pursue exercise science? Well, I, I think uh, ever since I was a kid, I've had this uh, fascination with high performance, uh, seeing high performance, understanding high performance, whether that's in sports or the arts or, you know, music. Uh, and as a kid, you know, I, I played a lot of sports, like most kids did soccer, track and field, I figure skated. And so I, I think that combined passion for, for sport coupled with the, the interest in, in high performance led me to an interest in sports psychology. Uh, and so when I, after I finished my bachelor's degree in uh, psychology, I was really interested in becoming a sports psychologist. And then that funneled me towards the exercise, exercise sciences for my, uh, for my graduate and postgraduate degrees. So you, so is your function now primarily in the research and education is regarding um, exercise science? And then that is what is used by the exercise physiologists and scientists that are working one-on-one -on -one or uh, one uh, with the athletes and the teams? Yeah, so I, I actually I got into this field because of an interest in sports psychology. But over time, I got more interested in the exercise and the health aspects of physical activity. And that led me away from high performance into an interest in health and exercise psychology. So I do very little work in sports psychology now, if any. Uh, and in fact, so my role here at UBC, I'm primarily a scientist. And in fact, I'm the director of a center for chronic disease prevention and management, which has been just an interesting turn of, of career over the past 20 years and seeing how a background in psychology, sports psychology, exercise psychology can parlay into a, a career uh, and, and as well as addressing research questions and questions of clinical significance to do with exercise and health behavior change and its impact on health and well-being. How would you, um, I like how you explain that, how, how would you define exercise uh, psychology for, for the general public who are listening to this show? Yeah, that's a great question. So exercise psychology is the area of psychology or, or health psychology that's focused on understanding why people are physically active or why they're not, understanding correlates and determinants of physical activity behavior, how to change that behavior, and in turn, the psychological outcomes of physical activity. 
So uh, there are some of us who focus on all areas of that uh, that spectrum, and some are focused on individual aspects. But overall, that um, exercise psychology overlaps heavily with high health psychology as well as behavioral medicine because we're all interested in that fundamental question of how can we get people more physically active, and in turn, what are the health psychological, the general well-being benefits of being more physically active. So it does differ from exercise physiology quite a bit. Um, and I just point that out probably because, you know, these terms may not be commonplace for, for many folks out there that aren't really directly related to the medical field. Yeah. So the physiologists are primarily concerned with what are the physiological benefits of exercise? So putting people on a treadmill and looking to see how fitness improves, how uh, you know blood glucose levels change and so on and so forth. But what the exercise psychologists are interested in, we, we always say, you know, it's fantastic that exercise has all these benefits, but if people don't actually do it, so what? So right. we're the people who are figuring out how to actually get people out being physically active and not just starting a physical activity regimen, but maintaining it over the long term, because that, that's where the real challenges are. The physiologists are also interested in strictly the physiological benefits of exercise, where the exercise psychologists were interested in the effects of exercise on depression, anxiety, uh, body image, quality of life. We work together. Some of my closest colleagues are my exercise physiologist colleagues. Um, I really enjoy working with them because it allows me to look not just at the psychological benefits, but the physiological benefits as well. And they also enjoy me working with them because when they're doing studies and they have difficulty getting participants to, to adhere to an exercise program, I can step in and give them some strategies to get that long-term adherence. You know, um, I'm going to uh, diverge for just a second and talk about how important it is uh, when you just talked about the psychology aspect. You can relate that to many aspects of medicine. And, you know, a prime example, for example, would be vaccines. Um, I, I always say, and actually I hear people say this too, so I'm not sure if I came up with this on my own or I heard another doctor or scientist say this, but, you know, vaccines don't prevent disease. Vaccination prevents disease. Giving the vaccine, receiving the vaccine, being open to the vaccine is what prevents disease, not the vaccine itself. And it's the same thing with exercise. Um, we can see the benefits of exercise, but if you're not participatory or you have a barrier for some reason, uh, you're not going to see those benefits. That's right. And like vaccines, it's not as simple as just prescribing, telling people to go do it. That's people right. have their own individual motivations, barriers, challenges, expectations uh, that need to be addressed if they're to actually uptake it. The interesting thing as well, I always say that exercise is probably one of the most difficult health behaviors to change because unlike a vaccination where you're just getting it once, once and done, exercise is something that you have to do over your lifetime. And it's not just one behavior. It's a whole series of behaviors. It's figuring out the equipment you need. It's getting dressed. It's making time. It's getting to a facility. It's doing the activity. It's cooling down. It's getting changed and going back in your routine for the rest of the day. There's so many pieces that go into it, which make it, I think, quite an extraordinary behavior to understand, but also to maintain. Absolutely. Yes. Way more complicated than just the decision uh, to vaccinate or not. But I, I do see some of the similarities in the sense that you have to bring into it, you have to bring some compassion into it. You can't just tell people something and expect them to go do those things. You have to understand them, listen, uh, look at their specific unique barriers, and then again, have the compassion to get them through that decision-making process. So tell me um, you know, what your primary research interests are. I know that's a kind of a loaded question that could take hours, but if you could just talk to the audience a little bit about what you're doing and uh, you know, those large grants, how you're uh, designing studies and, and what you hope to out of those studies. Sure. So I have a primary interest in people living with disabilities, primarily physical disability, but also work with a broader disability populations. 15% of the world's population lives with some form of disability, but we consistently see when efforts are focused on equity deserving groups that people with disabilities are at the very low level, lowest level of the hierarchy in terms of priorities. So my team works on developing strategies to promote physical activity for people with disabilities. And I say promote, I don't mean just telling people that it's good for them, but figuring out how to address the barriers to support people in initiating and maintaining physical activity long term. And I'm also very interested in understanding the health and, fit and psychological benefits of physical activity. I suspect that the amount of exercise that people with disabilities need to do to improve their health and well-being 
is lower than what's required for the general population simply because people with physical disabilities are at a lower level of fitness and physical activity than the general population. So I've devoted much of my career to trying to formulate exercise guidelines for those specific disability groups, knowing that there are significant barriers to participation and we should be aiming for a more realistic level of physical activity in people with disabilities relative to say the 150 to 300 minutes per week that's prescribed for the general population. And are you mostly talking about, Kathleen, the physical disabilities or are there some cognitive disabilities as well that your research is focused on? Yeah, I would say about uh, 90% of my research is focused on people with physical disabilities. I have a primary interest in people living with spinal cord injuries. Uh, but as you mentioned, I run the Canadian Disability Participation Program, and I work with almost 50 other scientists and community organizations. Many of them are focused on uh, increasing physical activity in children and youth, uh, people with sensory disabilities, intellectual disabilities, uh, the full range of possible impairments that could compromise a person's ability to fully participate in society. So your your research, and I, I know most people do understand this, but I'm just going to lay it out, is mostly funded, you know, not through um, uh, some type of a payment system. It's funded through grant and, and often government or research type institutions. And you've been highly successful. You and your staff have been highly successful. What do you think is the motivation uh, behind your success in those uh, particular areas? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think um, maybe I just need to explain the, the Canadian uh, research funding system a little bit. So we have three primary tracks for funding. We have a natural sciences and engineering tract, which I don't get funding from. We also have a, a CIHR, Canadian Institutes of Health Research, which is very similar to the NIH, and then a social sciences stream. And I think in getting funding from those federal funding streams, it, in my case, it's I've been able to... Uh, uh, align my research interests and demonstrate the value of physical activity for people with disabilities to the Canadian population in general. So for example, my research that's funded through Canadian Institutes of Health Research, uh, that focuses on understanding if we can use exercise to address problems of neuropathic pain in people living with spinal cord injury. We have a huge opioid mm -hmm. crisis in Canada, as I know also in the US. Uh, and so by strategically aligning my research program to address pain through non-pharmaceutical means, that aligns with priorities of our fe federal government in trying to, to mitigate the, the opioid crisis in our country. When I'm funded through the social sciences stream, uh, say, as I mentioned, we have 15% of our population living with disabilities. It presents not just a huge uh, financial um, uh, burden to our, to our healthcare system, but it, it's a huge social problem. We know people with disabilities live in social isolation. They're uh, more likely to live in poverty, poverty, to be underemployed. If we can develop strategies that use physical activity to support the physical, mental, social well-being of people living with disabilities, that's good, not just from a financial perspective from our country, but also from, from a, a social, from a workforce uh, uh, perspective as well. So I, I think those are some of the reasons why I've been able to, to translate some of my research interests into funding is because it's aligned with those priorities. And then also because in my lab, we're a community engaged research lab. What that means is that from the entire research process, from developing the research questions, to writing the grants, to implementing the research, I work very closely with the disability community, people living with disabilities, disability organizations, so that when we finish conducting the research, we're well, we're well positioned to take that research and turn it into products, tools, and services that people living in the community can actually use. So there's this constant give back within my research program. And I think that there's great appeal of that to, uh, to, the, to the funders that we work with. I love the term community engaged research lab. I mean, that is just fantastic. Do you actually say that out loud? We do, and I have a community-engaged research suite just down the hall from me, which is a, a big area where accessible, we can bring people in and uh, work on our projects together. So yeah, that's that's how we brand ourselves. Oh, that is fantastic. I may borrow that phrase or some uh, rendition of it someday. It's so super. Um, so, you know, everyone is really interested in, in motivation and behavioral change. Actually, I shouldn't say that. Not everyone, but many people are interested in it. And do you have any insights you can uh, deliver to the, this audience in about three minutes? Sure thing. 
Uh, I'll, so I'll do three, three and three no, minutes. No, I was teased, and I just mean you could talk for hours <laughs> on this, I am certain. So please take your time. Giving me a three-minute limit is a good strategy, Trey. Uh, so I'll, I'll give you three. Two of them are, come from sort of the broader broader literature. I can't lay claim to them, although they're things that I have worked on myself. Um, but I think, first of all, when it comes to motivation, we know now that it's not just about the amount of motivation. People will say, oh, I don't have any motivation. I'm not motivated enough. We know that it's not about the quantity of motivation. It's more about the quality of motivation that's going to determine whether we initiate and maintain a physical activity program long term. And what I mean by that is that you have to, you can't just go out there and exercise because your doctor told you to or because your family member is pushing you out the door. You have to find your own reasons. And we know that people who have uh, who enjoy exercise, who have these intrinsic motivations for exercise, they're going to be the people who are more likely to stick with it rather than the people who are signing up for gym membership to look good when they go to the beach. You know, that's a very extrinsically motivated right. reason to exercise. So I tell people like everyone has a reason for exercising. And I've, I've heard lots of very creative reasons over the years from the from the elderly woman who wanted to stay fit so she could wipe her little dog's feet when the dog came in from the backyard. She wanted to be fit to be able to get down and up and do that to, uh, you know, people in their 40s and 50s who still want to participate and compete in, in sports. I've heard everything in between. The key is to find your reason and to really internalize it and to to value that reason and, and to value um, the priority you placed on that reason for being active. So that that's sort of, the I think, the first key insight. Um, the second is that uh, when it comes to changing physical activity behavior over the long term, uh, there's a group of scientists in the UK who've developed this fantastic type taxonomy of 93 different behavior change techniques that can be used to change behavior. In physical activity, the most effective ones we see are action planning and self-monitoring. What that entails, it sounds so simple, Trey, but I've seen threefold increases in physical activity in people with disabilities who use this technique, let alone the general population. It simply involves opening up your calendar app or your pencil and paper calendar, scheduling your activities really specifically. So choose what days per week do you want to exercise, at what times, for how long and where. The more specific you can be, the better. Schedule that time. And then as each day comes up, you know, monitoring, are you doing the exercise that day? Are you having a hard time fitting it in? If so, why? And adjusting. Again, sounds so simple, but of the 93 different behavior change techniques, that's the one that consistently comes up again and again as being effective in helping people initiate and maintain long-term exercise program. The third uh, key insight is something that we've been working on in our lab, and that's looking at uh, from a mental health perspective, we're starting to see that it might be more the, the, the quality of the physical activity people are doing rather than the quantity of activity that they're doing in terms of improving aspects of quality life. Now, this is just in people with disabilities, but I think it might have generalizability to the general population. And what I mean by that is that it may not necessarily Certainly for health benefits, we know that there is a threshold of activity needed to derive uh, reductions in risk for certain cancers, for COPD, for diabetes, and so on. But for mental health, it's always been a, a little fuzzy about how much activity is necessary. And we're doing work with people with disabilities, which suggests that it's not the, the number of minutes that leads to some of these changes in mental health, but it's whether the activity they're doing leads to uh, feelings of autonomy, belongingness, challenge, engagement, mastery, meaning. These six key elements we've identified as key to a quality physical activity participation experience. And we're starting to see that by ensuring that people experience at least a couple of those elements in each of their workouts, that this could be more conducive to, to seeing improvements in, in their mental health. I think that was a little more than three minutes. But I, I, I hope I gave you three good ones. No, it's perfect, though. I'll, I'll go back to number two and just stress that one, um, which is, you know, making the exact um, specific time and, ha and maybe even location uh, and duration of the activity. I think we can all relate to that um, just for other aspects in our life. You can have a really long to do list, but that list doesn't do much just sitting there unless you've blocked off the exact amount of time that it's going to take to get it done. And I know I still am guilty of that today. I have a long to-do list, but if I don't put it on my calendar, chances are by the end of the day, I will look and at least several items will still be on that uh, to-do list. 
And so when I think about exercise, knowing exactly that I'm going to block that time off for myself, no one else can interfere with it. It also motivates me. Uh, I have to hold myself accountable to it. Even as someone who actually um, has, you know, enjoys exercise and sees the benefits of it uh, and doesn't have that typical barrier, it it's more effective if I can actually schedule the time. And that's what's happening. There's no question at 6 a.m. there I'm going on a run and there's nothing else that can interfere with that, you know, beyond an urgent or emergent need. So I really like that suggestion. I, I also sometimes speak with patients, you know, as an emergency room physician, of course, um, not my area to focus a lot on some of the uh, preventative aspects, but I do my best. And when I get into exercise, I, I try to figure out what is your specific barrier. And I'm surprised by some of the answers. Um, sometimes it's barriers that really do seem out of that individual's control. And is there a way to bring in the resources to help them? For example, a spouse who's not interested in them, uh, taking the time to do these things on their own, you know, all kinds of, of really barriers that we can help them address. So have yeah. you seen any, go, go ahead, sorry. I, I... I agree with you. Like everybody has barriers and something we've been uh, working on in my lab over the past few months is tracking those barriers over time. And there really is this dynamic flow or pattern of barriers where I think when people are starting to exercise, the barriers are quite proximal. As you said, it could be a spouse that's not supportive or they don't have the equipment. So then as they get going and their sort of exercise landscape changes that they might be uh, trying out a gym or, you know, trying a new activity, the barriers themselves often change. And I think as exercise counselors or people who speak to people about exercise, it's really important to constantly or consistently check in with them about those barriers to offer up new support and um, advice as their exercise patterns change. Those barriers are going to change and they're going to need that support. Yeah, that's great. You know, back to the research aspect, because I know I'm, I'm tending to move towards uh, implementation, but back to the research aspect, um, what have you seen that's that's been, and I'm kind of just asking this off the cuff, but uh, that's been surprising or changed throughout your career as far as the results of some of the research you and your colleagues have done? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um I think probably, you know, when you you mentioned implementation, so I, I think that is something that we've started to see that for so long we were focused on just doing these nice, well-controlled little trials in our labs and showing exercise is good and has these benefits and we get people to increase activity. And then, you know, we kind of walk away and are surprised when people are no longer exercising. That's been a, a big change over the past few years is there's been this greatest, greater focus on implementation. And so we've got some outstanding implementation scientists who have now stepped in and who are beginning to unpack this whole black box of how do we translate these randomized controlled trials, these interventions that we run that promote activity, how do we translate them into community and into sustainable programs? One of the things I've been most surprised about as we've been transferring and, and implementing is that uh, I was of the impression, you know, I just mentioned to you about how barriers change over time and we need to consistently give people support. Uh, we're running an implementation trial right now where we've been giving people support over the course of a year. And interestingly, at about uh, three months or so, people people seem to get it. Like we give them con continuous physical activity counseling, but after three months, like, all right, enough with the phone calls. I've got it. So that's been surprising to me to have sort of a mind shift that you know, people can do. We haven't been giving people enough support traditionally because we finish the trials and we leave them to their own devices. On the other hand, people don't need support, I don't think, forever and ever. Uh, they might need to check in every once in a while, but they don't need hand-holding. So there is a, st a sweet spot, I think, for um, uh, supporting people in their physical activity programs. We're still trying to figure that out, but I think it probably is about uh, three to six months. Uh, and again, I'm talking about people living with disabilities. It could be different for the general population, right. but um, I'm, I'm very excited about what's happening in the implementation science aspect of exercise psychology, because that's been that sort of the black box, the missing piece for all these years is how do we actually put this stuff into practice and make a difference at a, at a population level? You yourself are, are a runner, I am told, but were, were you um, a runner prior to going into this career or was being in the career what motivated you to run? 
<laughs> no, I didn't take up running until I was well in my 30s, actually, when my when my daughter was born. And as a new parent, I uh, just had no time to do the types of exercises I enjoyed doing before. And running became this, uh, this thing that I could do when she was napping. I could take her out in the stroller. And I lived in an area that had a, a beautiful rail trail that was nice and shady. Um, so it and it was marked kilometer by kilometer. And I realized I was going a little bit further and further as I went. And uh, that uh, just became a passion, something that I've, I've enjoyed doing. You know, she's 15 years old now, and I'm still running, but I didn't start till later in life. That's great. And and you, you actually mentioned something I was actually going to ask this earlier. So, and so I'll go ahead and ask you real quick. You talked about you were going a little further, and that was motivation. Do you see motivation as um through progress, uh, useful or not useful or dependent upon the individual themselves? Mm, great question. I think so. Very interesting. When we look at behavior change techniques that work, there's one that we know for sure doesn't work. And I would say, do not include this in your intervention because time and time again, this actually decreases people, people's physical activity behavior. And that's when scientists monitor what they're doing but don't give them any feedback. So for example, mm -hmm. they might give them a pedometer and tell them, we're not going to let you see it. And we're not going to tell you how you did. That actually decreases motivation. So I think to answer your question, I think most people are motivated by seeing progress and knowing that they're improving. Some people are more motivated than others. Like myself, I'm very competitive. So being able to push myself and be able to check off more kilometers, that really drives me. But I know there's plenty of people who are just, you know, just be able to do a couple of kilometers is, is good and, and that's fine. But uh, I think people in general want to know that they're making progress or at least achieving uh, the goals that they set for themselves in their mind. Yes, that's great. Um, so you're also a traveler, I'm told. Do you mix your running and your traveling together? I do. You know, I think being able to see a city from street level running in the morning before the city comes alive. That's my favorite way to see a city. You know, when, when everyone is bustling on the streets, it's not quite the same. In the morning, you can kind of get on the road and see the buildings. So yeah, I pack my running shoes wherever I go and uh, I run every chance I can get to explore a new city. That's great. You know, I, I'm the same way and as, as are many of my uh, associates. It's funny because um, some people say, oh, you're going on vacation. So that means you can take a break from running. And in my mind, I think I'm going on vacation. That means I get to run more uh, because you're in a different place and you have more protected time. Uh, and of course, it's just it's such a feel good activity. So what are you looking forward to as we sort of wrap up here, uh, both personally and professionally over the next year or two? Uh, and what am I looking forward to? Well, uh, on that note of travel, I'm looking forward to getting back out on the road again. I've got uh, some exciting uh, invitations to give talks at various places around the world. So very excited to take my running shoes and to take my PowerPoints and <laughs> get on the road and see colleagues again. Uh, in the lab, we uh, the pandemic shut down our research for two long years because most of our work involves bringing people in and working face to face. So just this summer, we got ramped up again started six or seven different projects. So I'm so excited to be pursuing those projects to get our data in and begin to see. We're, we're very much interested in uh, looking at exercise patterns long-term in people with disabilities and how those fluctuations in exercise might be related to fluctuations in mental health. So that's a long-term project where we're just getting underway. So really looking forward to getting back to a new normal and uh, just yeah, just getting back to getting back to life again. No, that's great. Well, thank you, Dr. Kathleen Martin Guinness. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Trey. It's my pleasure. And thank you for joining us on Medical Matters Weekly. I will also acknowledge uh, Mike Cutler from CAT TV, Ray Smith from Southwestern Vermont Healthcare, Ashley Jowett from Southwestern Vermont Healthcare. I'm Trey Dobson. Go out and find joy in everything you do, even in the face of adversity. And we'll see you again next week. <laughs>